it's really a privilege to moderate this panel. Um, as has been underscored by our keynote speakers, green corruption, environmental crimes, nature crimes, whatever you want to call them, uh, and national and international security are intricately connected. Um, I think Director Gaki shared a couple of stats, but I, you know, one that stands out to me is the World Bank in 2019 put out a report that found that uh, illegal logging, fishing, and wildlife trade um, amounted to about a one to two trillion dollar a year industry. Right. So this is a, a really fundamental issue um, when we're thinking about crime and corruption overall. Today's discussion and the leading thinkers featured on the stage represent a significant paradigm shift on this issue from an approach that has really been focused on the middlemen to a focus on the transnational criminal organizations that mastermind the trade and prosecuting these crimes in a way that really target the mechanisms that have allowed these crimes to flourish. This shift uh, turns upside down this notion that wildlife crime is a low risk, high profit business for criminal enterprises. And that's really what we've been hoping to see for decades, right? Uh, this wasn't an overnight shift. I wanna mention NGOs like WWF, like the Wildlife Conservation Society, the Wildlife Institute of India, Freeland, and the Environmental Inst Investigative Agency, among others, have for decades pioneered efforts to track and expose criminal activity related to wildlife and the environment and help policymakers understand how environmental crimes and green corruption connect to broader national security risks. So this has been a, a long time coming and I'm so pleased for the opportunity to introduce our panelists for today's discussion. Uh, Him Das, until very recently, um, was the acting director of the Department of the Treasury's Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, or FinCEN. Him previously held posi positions in the private sector where he advised on cryptocurrency and enforcement and worked on innovative technologies to help financial institutions monitor for illicit finance. He has a deep and diverse expertise, having served in different positions at the Treasury Department, the National Security Council, the National Economic Council, and the State Department, where he focused on international trade, investment, sanctions, and the development of the domestic and international framework to combat terrorist financing. So he brings a lot of expertise to this discussion. Roberto Troya, uh, at the end there, uh, Dr. Roberto Troya, I should say, <laughs> brings to this, this discussion a long history of leadership in the conser conservation space. He is currently the vice president of WWF US country offices and the regional director for WWF Latin America. An expert in international and Latin American conservation policy, Roberto previously held positions at the Nature Conservancy and in service to the president of Ecuador under the Environmental Advisory Commission, where he led the creation of the National Environmental Fund, the Galapagos Special Law, and the National Biodiversity Strategy. He was also the executive director of Fundacion Natura, a leading in conservation organization in the region. And finally, we have Johanny Grossman, who didn't get a proper introduction, so I'm gonna go ahead and take the, the lead here, if you don't mind. Um, I, I actually was wondering, Johanny, what kind of coffee you drink, because when you read his bio, he does a lot. Um, so <laughs> Johanny is the team lead for the Green Corruption Program and a senior advisor for Central and Eastern Europe at the Basel Institute on Governance. As the leader of the Green Corruption Program, Yohani has grown the program to a 20-member team in eight countries, which are tasked with providing advisory work to law enforcement and building corruption prevention systems at natural resource agencies and state-owned enterprises. Yohani also leads the Basel Institute's support to Ukraine, including advisory work to Ukrainian ministries and collaboration with Ukrainian civil society to strengthen Ukraine's restoration efforts. Prior to joining the Institute, Yohani spent close to 20 years in Indonesia, the Philippines, Ukraine, and Russia leading large-scale anti-corruption and good governance programs for, for USAID. So it's really wonderful to welcome you all here today. Thank you very much for your partnership on today's event. Um, Hindas, why don't we start with you? You have this really long and uh, uh, interesting history of working in the government space on anti-corruption and how to deal with illicit uh, financial crimes. Can you talk to us about how you came to this issue and, and what you've seen over the last two years at FinCEN? Sure, absolutely. And, and do I have to, it's, yep, you're good. Um, first of all, thank you for having me, and thanks to Ambassador Sparber and the Basel Institute and the Wilson Center for having uh, me today, and thanks to all of you for your time and consideration. This is an incredibly important topic. Um, I actually came to this from a very different a angle. Um, I started out my career as an atmospheric scientist. I was going to uh, mention that. Yeah. And <laughs> I spent a lot of time um, working on climate change-related issues, um, 
in all of my previous capacities, either as a lawyer or as a policy person, because there's always an intersection between international economic policy, uh, climate change, um, and uh, and ultimately uh, combating uh, 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 efforts to degrade biodiversity and, and climate change. And, and my role as uh, acting director for FinCEN allowed me to expand that uh, sort of broader perspective into another area, which is incredibly important. Um, and you know, as I spent time working on this issue as acting director, it reinforced the importance of dealing with these issues from an enforcement perspective and from a transparency perspective. Again, as Director Gaffey said, uh, nature crimes are uh, a major transnational organized crime. Um, it generates billions of dollars of proceeds every year. Um, it fuels corruption, it threatens biodiversity, uh, it erodes confidence and integrity in the overall international efforts around biodiversity and climate change. Um, and so, uh, so, uh, so the, the focus on financial crimes as it relates to uh, environmental crimes and nature crimes is incredibly important. Um, I just want to note that, you know, from my perspective, the AML CFT framework is actually critical to enhancing transparency. As, uh, as Richard Nephew said, and that's actually fundamental to ensure that there's a well-regulated uh, framework uh, for ensuring that financial institutions are aware of and uh, understand uh, financial crimes typologies, uh, red flags and indicators related to nature crimes is fundamentally important. Um, uh, focusing on efforts to prevent bad actors from acting anonymously and hiding behind shell companies and opaque vehicles is incredibly important as well. Um, and ensuring that law enforcement uh, and, uh, and uh, financial institutions and other stakeholders uh, work together is incredibly important. And that's what we did from a FinCEN perspective. Um, again, um, as the speaker said, it's a whole of government effort, first mm -hmm. of all. Um, uh, and FIU's financial intelligence units like FinCEN play uh, one part in the overall effort with law enforcement agencies, with national security agencies, agencies focused on anti-corruption efforts, and others as well. And I think the fundamental piece of all of this is, as governmental actors, uh, the importance of collaboration and coordination across all of the actors within government is incredibly important. I think, as Ambassador Sparber also said, it's a whole society effort. Yeah. Um, the private sector plays an incredibly important role um, from a financial institution's perspective in terms of having resilient, uh, strong, uh, effective uh, AML CFT compliance programs. And I think that NGOs also play a critical uh, role as well in terms of their investigative efforts, um, as well as their use of open source intelligence to be able to mm -hmm. better understand um, uh, uh, typologies, efforts, and actions going on by bad actors with respect to uh, 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 financial crimes as they're linked to nature crimes as well. Um, I, I think I can pause there um, for a second. Um, I can keep going. I, I mean, I think that ultimately there are sort of three different dimensions from my perspective. One is awareness, um, and it's incredibly incumbent on uh, government um, uh, to create awareness. I think uh, in FinCEN published in 2021, um, a uh, national AML CFT priorities that focused on a number of different key priorities uh, that uh, were the focus of law enforcement and other US government agencies with respect to predicate crimes that have links to money laundering. Um, uh, environmental crimes uh, feature within two of those, uh, two or maybe even more of those uh, national AML CFT priorities with respect to transnational uh, criminal organizations, TCOs, as well as with respect to uh, corruption. And I think it's important uh, that uh, the U.S. government and others uh, help financial institutions understand how nature crimes fit within those broader priorities so financial institutions can understand how to prioritize resources mm -hmm. within their overall AML CFT framework. I think a, a second critical ingredient of this is, as Director Gacky mentioned, uh, FinCEN has done a lot um, around ensuring and creating awareness around uh, uh, nature crimes and environmental crimes. She mentioned the FinCEN notice in 2021 and the FinCEN exchange that was conducted that brought law enforcement agencies together. We did a financial trend analysis in 2021 that looked at data and suspicious activity reporting over the prior three years to better understand exactly what the reporting looked like, as well as to better understand typologies, 
uh, red flags, indicators, and to also provide a better sense to financial institutions of what was being reported and where uh, additional reporting might be useful. Um, I think FinTrack as well, the Australian FIU, uh, recently published an operational alert on money laundering and uh, the illegal wildlife trade. Again, that's a very useful document in terms of a, raising awareness on the issue um, from a Canadian perspective, but also from an international perspective, and providing a little bit more guidance to financial institution on how nature crimes are linked to other crimes like transnational criminal organization activity and, and corruption activity. I think a, a key point on the awareness piece of it is that in the FinCEN notice, we included an indicator which financial institutions could use to flag uh, uh, suspicious activity reporting that had an environmental crime dimension to it. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, tracking mechanisms like that help uh, not only FinCEN from a record keeping and reporting and a tracking perspective, a statistical and analytical uh, perspective to better and more effectively and quickly understand, tr understand trends around financial crimes, but it also allows law enforcement agencies to look directly at those uh, uh, suspicious activity reports in a much more efficient way. Mm -hmm. Um, and again, when FinCEN publishes notices, alerts, advisories around a particular uh, criminal activity, whether it's human smuggling, human trafficking, whether it's export controls, evasion related to Russia, uh, whether it's online uh, ch child sexual exploitation, we see a significant uptick in the type and quality of reporting from financial institutions, which provides an additional benefit to law enforcement to be able to track that down. I think there's two other dimensions that I want to just quickly touch upon. One is just the development of actionable material. Um, I think that both the public and private sectors have a responsibility to develop and share actionable information. Um, and I think that more work needs to be done. There's been a lot of focus on uh, the illegal wildlife trade um, as it relates to uh, financial crimes, but I think that there's more work to be, uh, to be done to better understand uh, uh, illicit activities, typologies, trends around the broader range of nature crimes that Director Gacky mentioned. Um, and that's a, a, a key part of the overall puzzle is to be able to develop a more comprehensive framework. I think another piece of it in terms of developing actionable material is uh, given the convergence around typologies, red flags, and indicators around different types of crimes linked to uh, nature crimes, it's incredibly important uh, uh, for um, both NGOs as well as the government to be able to identify particular actors, um, shell companies and others, the broader networks, uh, to be able to ensure that financial institutions have actionable uh, information where they can use their own transaction monitoring systems, their own KYC procedures to build out a broader network. Um, and then provide that information back to government through suspicious activity reporting in a way uh, that law enforcement can use. Um, the last thing I just want to mention is something Director uh, Gacky mentioned as well, which is just public-private partnerships. Um, I think that, again, uh, the U.S. government has a number of vehicles through which we can exchange information uh, between law enforcement and financial institutions, both domestically and potentially on a cross-border basis as well. Um, and I think that uh, from a U.S. government perspective, there are three different vehicles. Uh, the FinCEN exchanges, as uh, Director Gacky mentioned, uh, and then we have uh, legal mechanisms in which, through which law enforcement can share information uh, with financial institutions, the 314A mechanism, and that financial institutions can share information amongst themselves, the 314B program, which allows them to share information and build out networks um, so that they can file uh, better suspicious activity reporting. And having these tools work together um, on a real-time basis in a strategic manner is incredibly important to be able to uh, help law enforcement fight financial crimes. Ensuring that the right people are at the table is critical to ensure that not only FinCEN or the FIU is at the table, but also the key uh, law enforcement agencies like the Fish and Wildlife Service, HSI and others, as well as the right set of financial institutions to be able to build out these frameworks on an iterative basis. Um, I think that uh, the Canadians are doing this through Project Anton, and there are a number of other efforts that are ongoing. I think that, again, you know, uh, Director Gacky mentioned the collaborative effort that we have with South Africa. Um, and one of the key pieces of all of this is what we've seen through FinCEN exchanges in other areas is that if you have law enforcement bring to the table particular 
uh, operational efforts, particular typologies or red flags, it becomes a very constructive feedback conversation between financial institutions and law enforcement to be able to better build out a network of bad actors and allow law enforcement to more efficiently and strategically go after bad actors as well. That's great. Thank you so much. That was a good layout of a lot of the tools that have emerged and how they can be better leveraged. Uh, Roberto, can I turn to you and thinking, you know, as somebody who's been working in the conservation space for a long time, um, how can these tools be brought to bear in environmental NGOs like WWF um, and, and recognizing how, you know, the presence that you have globally, how do you take these anti-corruption tools and, and implement them um, both in sort of regional cases, but also uh, uh, internationally. Thank you so much, <coughs> Lauren. I would like to express my gratitude to the Basel Institute for having us and being a great partner of us, and also the Wilson Center for providing us this platform for this discussion that, that I think is super important. Um, World Wildlife Fund has uh, the privilege of engaging in a collaboration with uh, the Basel, Basel Institute um, through uh, our USAID-funded TNRC, Targeting Natural Resource Corruption Project. Um, the goal of that project has been to unearth and disseminate knowledge concerning the devastating impact of corruption on environmental and conservation endeavors. It aimed to equip, equip our conservation practitioners with tools, uh, guidance, and integrate this knowledge into their work. Uh, we have successfully pursued these objectives by forging research partnerships and drawing insights from practical experiences. Um, I bring uh, an angle that many of you have, uh, but it's so crucial. It's the daily, the down to the ground, from the ground up approach, where you go to the field and see how corruption is happening in different stages and forms. And when you have the conclusion that corruption becomes part of the culture and it becomes part of the political culture, and when you conclude um, that, uh, for instance, enforcement, enforcement measures, the, the judicial system uh, has been um, uh, part of that culture, then the, the work comes uphill. Uh, if you think about being in the middle of uh, Peru in the Madre de Dios, this Amazon state where um, illegal gold mining is happening, and you go in the middle of the jungle, in the middle, in a, in a river far away from any part of, of civilization, and you find a machinery that costs uh, seven to close to seven million dollars in terms of uh, machinery used for extraction of illegal gold. And the, 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 the fuel and the, everything you need to operate it. You think, where is it coming from? How did it get there? There are no roads. It was brought by helicopters. Those helicopters departed from a, a particular place. Somebody allowed that to happen. When you start seeing on the ground up how the, uh, those elements are coming to fruition in your daily work, then it hits you in the face. I was so amazed by, by the presentation from the Minister of Ukraine. We're talking about enabling conditions, and when those enabling conditions are so harsh, so difficult, talking about even surviving is, is a topic. Keeping uh, life on Earth is even more difficult. So from a TNRC perspective, we have been working closely in order to understand what is it all about. Conservation organizations have been exposed to this from the very beginning, of course. But we, we don't have the tools, we don't have the capacity, we want to understand better. Some of us have been more exposed to the theory and to the practice, some others. But making it more systematically, understanding how we can work at a global stage. We're m present in more one than 100 countries, and, and somebody mentioned DRC. Um, there are problems I, come, I recently claimed from, from uh, uh, Nepal, where we have had very significant problems in terms of enforcement. And it is linked to corruption, but it's linked to human pressure. Um, if you see Chituan National Park in Nepal, for instance, you'll realize that it's surrounded by lots and many, many communities and people. And you can't imagine how Nepal has been able to double the number, or almost triple the number of tigers in that country. How is that possible? How enforcement is happening differently there, or how environmental crime is being pursued in, in a different way? 
uh, being so close to China and India, for instance. In other places, in other countries, I mentioned Peru, but I was, I was telling uh, Lauren about uh, Mexico, where doing conservation is so difficult. I was talking about the Gulf of California, where the vaquita, this little purpose, this little dolphin is about to be extinct. And if you see what's behind it, you'll realize that um, uh, the fishery of totoaba, which is this large fish that has this long bladder that is being sold in, in some markets, illegal markets, at a very high price, you'll realize that totoaba and the totoaba bladder are using the same channels that other illegal uh, crime activities are using to um, move, move, move it around th those markets. So you link totoaba with illegal gold, with um, other, uh, other commodities that are illegal, illegally taken, Ill illegally exploited, like, like uh, 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 many others. And you realize that there's a real connection between those and international crime, for instance. Um, we have a very important work with uh, traffic. This uh, traffic is, is an organization linked to us that uh, takes care of our work with illegal, illegal trade. And we are conducting a research on illegal wildlife trade cases and analyzing data sets to develop risk typologies for timber concessions. Timber is a fungible element. Mm -hmm. It can easily be f hidden. The, the legal timber can be hidden in with, uh, with illegal timber. That happens with all fungible elements. Gold, how, how can you trace illegal gold? It's almost impossible. Now they're trying some new technologies and some innovations to do it. So anyway, um, I just wanted to to mention that it is an ongoing quest. At a global level, we are sharing and learning. We are uh, learning from different examples all over the world, in Latin America, of course, where I come from. Um, at a regional uh, scale, we are also uh, trying to know what Peru is doing and Colombia are doing in, in their Amazon work. So uh, we're between countries that are sharing, for instance, part of the Amazon basin is something that we are looking into. Actually, we have an initiative aimed to stop illegal gold mining in the Amazon uh, in, the next, uh, in the next years to come. That's great. Thank you, Roberto. We'll come back to you in just a minute. Um, but, Yuhani, this is you know, something that you've been working on for decades at this point, um, and you bring a really interesting perspective as somebody who is in the development space as well and recognizing the connections between conservation and development and then this anti-corruption lens. Um, I wonder if you can share with us some of the lessons learned from the green corruption program around the world and where you uh, where are the challenges now and what sort of hurdles are you working to overcome? Thanks, Lauren. Um, I, I realize I'm the last speaker in a jam-packed schedule and the last thing dividing you from Q&A, so I'll try to be <laughs> very succinct. Um, so the first thing I, I wanted to note is that um, uh, as as uh, Ambassador Spaba and Coordinator Nephew already mentioned, we're we're doing this event in the lead up to the the conference in Atlanta, mm. uh, and uh, one of the things that that I've I've learned uh, earlier this week is that there is an astonishing fifteen proposals for side events on environmental mm. corruption in the Atlanta UN Convention Against uh, Corruption. Uh, conference of state parties. So this is not an environmental conference, right? Mm -hmm. But there's 15 proposals for side events focused on this intersection. So uh, I think at least in our sort of nerdy little world, we're becoming quite mainstream, which is wonderful. Because four, four years ago, when the first resolution was adopted on this issue in Abu Dhabi in 2019, that was not the case, right? Um, uh, those of us on the anti-corruption side struggled to, to understand these sort of soft issues related to conservation. And, and I dare say, uh, I don't know if you'll agree with me, that the conservation community was also a little bit apprehensive about mm. talking about corruption. Mm -hmm. so, so we've come a really long way in those four years. Um, and, uh, and that was also the time that we started our program on green corruption. In fact, uh, I, I did my job interview at the sidelines of the UN Convention Against Corruption. So uh, coming full circle here, I guess. Um, so, um, so sticking with the number four, uh, I just want to draw out four key lessons uh, that we've learned uh, implementing the Green Corruption Program. Um, we operate in, in eight countries where we have adve embedded advisors with law enforcement, with natural resource agencies, looking at both the enforcement uh, and the prevention side, so eight countries and four continents. Um, and so the first 
uh, is that we see a significant increase in the conceptual openness to this kind of cross-sectoral programming. Again, this is really new. Uh, and countries that we just start operating, we, s we still see that residual apprehension. You know, when we talk to natural resource agencies and we mentioned the word corruption, their initial, their initial reaction is to just try to stop us from talking about corruption because they feel like talking about it is going to make it worse. Um, and so there is a there's a lot of effort that goes into building those sort of trust based relationships where you can have these mm -hmm. kind of conversations. And in fact, our partnership with WWF uh, around the world, but especially in Latin America and difficult to operate places like Bolivia, for example, has been quite crucial because when we come together as a conservation and anti-corruption group, it gives us a whole different kind of credibility uh, in conversations with government. So anyway, this cross cross sectoral space, there's a lot more openness to it. Um, on the enforcement side, um, so we have we have about ten anti-corruption financial investigators, uh, prosecu ex prosecutors working around the world, and so trying to sort of sum up the lessons from that that experience um, is that I think first of all that the anti-corruption tools, so financial investigations, asset recovery, these sorts of things, uh, are quite well suited to the environmental space. I think we, we've seen quite a lot of enforcement successes uh, in this space. Of course, they are slow because these things are very slow, so people have to be patient, including, including our donors, and thankfully most of them are. Um, uh, but there are, there's very significant progress uh, on these issues. Um, now, at the same time, what we see is that there is individuals inside, for example, wildlife agencies or forestry agencies that have enforcement authorities that are interested, but the institution itself just isn't focused on that sort of thing. They're focused on short-term uh, immediate conservation uh, enforcement efforts, which are, of course, crucial. That's, that's what they were designed for. And so when you come in, when you say, here's a different skill set that's needed, you know, this case is going to take three to five years, uh, then that's a very difficult sell. And so one of the things that we've, we've done together, again, with WWF and Traffic and TI, is that we've created a practitioners forum for folks around the world working in this space, uh, and when with the support of, of USAID and Liechtenstein, actually, for practitioners in this space. And it already has a whole bunch of subgroups, including one on financial investigations, where we try to bring together investigators and get that one, two, three people in each of these agencies that are keen to do it uh, so that they can be supported by their peers in other countries. Um, because, again, this is a foreign concept in most of these agencies. Uh, and then, perhaps a little bit more controversially, I'll say that one of the things that we have learned uh, as we moved from the wildlife space to increasingly also take on cases related to deforestation, cases related to gold, cases related to IUU fishing, um, is that from an investigative and prosecutorial perspective, the differences between the types uh, of commodities, types of natural resources are modest. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, again, I say that with a great amount of care because mm -hmm. I'll be heavily criticized by some folks who are deep into the IUU fishing sector, for example. So I'm not saying the sectors are the same, but the law enforcement tools are quite similar. And so it's one of the areas I think that's rife for sort of silo disruption mm -hmm. because there isn't really a lot of sense to have a financial investigator that only does IU fishing cases and doesn't do deforestation cases, for example. Um, so the third point, uh, if you're keeping track, uh, is regards to the prevention side. So uh, on the prevention side, uh, this is a more recently emerging space where we're trying to apply corruption prevention tools, risk management tools to natural resource agencies and SOEs. Um, and so here, I think that the first realization that we made that, that is sort of a uh, somber realization basically is that basically that the um, the under under resourcing of environmental agencies that we do as a society worldwide is reflected exponentially in their ability to control their internal corruption risks right so we don't allocate enough money to conservation to natural resource management those agencies are chronically underfunded and with those scarce resources that they have they're going to assign even less 
to building in robust internal corruption prevention systems. So even in comparison to spaces that I've worked in before, like education, like health, we see a significantly lower level of capacity and commitment um, uh, to building those kind of compliance systems. So that that's really challenging and, and really frustrating actually. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, it's also a great opportunity because in terms of sort of allocating our own and, and donors scarce resources, there is a pool where there is likely to be relatively quick payoff, which is <laughs> a rare thing in development programming because of the low, low level that we're starting off with. Uh, and so we've seen really good commitment uh, from um, natural resource and conservation agencies and SOEs in Indonesia, for example. Uh, the forestry um, SOE in Indonesia is really uh, very much into this. Uh, and especially when we see that um, there is a desire for by the regulators uh, or where those are separated by uh, the business entity of the natural resource agencies like a state-owned enterprise entering global markets where they're going to be subject to the scrutinies and the compliance requirements that engaging in global markets requires and seeking financing requires, suddenly they're very open to this. So there's really uh, great opportunities here to, to invest in that for programming. Uh, and finally, um, I think uh, as, as sort of comfort zone stretching as this space is, both for the anti-corruption and the conservation space, I think there's still a lot more that we can do. Uh, and and uh, him mentioned, for example, the engagement with the private sector, which is has tremendous potential. Uh, and I would argue that we've only just started in that space. There's a lot more that can happen. And of course, FinCEN is one of the, the leaders in this space, uh, but many of the other uh, countries that we operate in really struggle with this and are still very much boxed in um, by what can be shared and how the private sector can engage with law enforcement in this space. So our hope is that um, there is sufficient space for experimental programming and high-risk programming uh, that will allow us uh, and, and all our partners, of course, to engage, to continue engaging and continue coming up with new approaches. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'd just to like to highlight again at the end of my, my brief intervention that some donors are really progressive in that regard. And the uh, TNRC project funded by USAID and, and Kyle Rierich is here from USAID um, has been has been sort of uh, path breaking in this regard. I think having such a long term program that is really focused on a learning and and uh, trying to apply skills from one space into the other and testing that out is really unique. And of course, the, the long term support the for uh, in core funding that we have from the Principality of Liechtenstein allows us to engage in a lot of uh, innovative programming. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Johanny. Um, I have a couple questions, but I want to turn to the audience, too, to see if there are any questions in the audience and if any have come in online. Um, Jason, have any come in online? Okay, we'll start with a, maybe one or two from online, and then uh, I'm giving you all a heads up that I'm going to come back to the audience in person in just a minute and hope that you will uh, raise your hand, and what I'll do is I'll have a colleague bring you a microphone, and you can tell us your name and your affiliation before getting quickly to your question. But Jason, let's start with the online questions. Hi, we've received two questions from online. Um, just to kind of distill them down, the first one asks, what is the role of whistleblowers in um, mm. fighting cor corruption, and what role would you like to see them play? Uh, the other question relates to China and what role China plays in this. Uh, in particular, they focused the question focused on the BRI and uh, and to what extent the BRI has facilitated uh, corruption. Thanks. I'm I'm going to add to the China question because it relates to a question that I had, which is thinking about the Latin America context. Um, I think uh, we have a, a global fellow here, is an environmental journalist, Sharon Guinup, who's written extensively on wildlife trafficking. She wrote for us in in March of this year about. Uh, the growth in um, the sort of trans-Pacific animal trade between Latin America and China. And of course, with the vaquita and the totoaba, there is a Chinese connection there. And so thinking about um, these are sort of large geopolitical challenges, right? But then they have real uh, context at the local level. And so how, do, how, do, uh, how can these efforts sort of 
um, address that local context while also taking into consideration some of these um, larger geopolitical implications. Okay, so first, for the role of whistleblowers, does anybody want to respond to that? I, I can touch upon that a little bit because I, I think uh, part of what we do is like um, enable or become those whistleblowers in many cases, of course. Um, there is a daunting uh, um, a note that I read uh, the other day about the connection between uh, what's going on in Latin America with uh, conservation and conservationists. And Colombia becomes the number one place in the world where conservationists are being killed. Yeah. So the connection between all this with violence is really there. And becoming a whistleblower in those conditions becomes a risky business. So I think uh, um, when we talk about who, who blows the horn there, when we talk about who is brave enough to come out and express that something's going on, there's an additional element of uh, risk that that person or persons are facing. And probably that's what, what uh, you were referring to. Uh, in many cases, uh, conservation organizations are playing a lower role, a not so visible role, because of, for instance, do, do it in Colombia and you are at risk for instance. So there is th that factor. But I think it still becomes one of the fundamental elements of what we need to do is enable and make sure that those people who are uh, witnessing, who are um, close to where the corruption is happening, that they have all the assurance and all the, the, um, all the protection that is needed and all the confidentiality and uh, uh, to, to come up forward. Very difficult, very complex in, 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 in the world we work. China just, I just want to mention that one of our initiatives in, in Latin America is Jaguar. Jaguar spans from the south of uh, the United States down to Patagonia. The only country that doesn't have Jaguar in Latin America is, is Chile. But every other country shares Jaguars. And especially in the Amazon, we have observed with the um, uh, increased presence of infrastructure projects in, uh, coming from China constructors the incidence of Jaguar capture has increased significantly. And there is a, there is a leakage pr problem. Uh, as uh, tiger conservation in other parts of the world is becoming stronger, um, some uh, quote-unquote consumers of uh, wildlife parts are, are turning their heads into other parts where uh, big cats are, are there, and Jaguar comes to the picture. So Jaguar numbers have increased, in, uh, like Jaguar, uh, illegal, uh, illegal capture of Jaguars or killings of, of Jaguars and selling of those parts has increased mm -hmm. due to this point. And it comes back to the, to the notion of how, why is that happening? Who is enforcing? Why are these companies that are coming and to, uh, to do projects of infrastructure, which is one example, or, or mining or what have you, that China is, is super present in the, in the region, are coming with less uh, accountability from their government, from one side, but also um, those credits that China, uh, you were talking about following the money. The credits that are coming from China are coming with less safeguards. So instead of hiring the, uh, the, the usual traditional financial institutions that we are working with, uh, like the World Bank or the IDB or CAF, they go to the, the, to the, per, to the country that brings less safeguards to their work. So that's less expensive, um, allows more space for corruption because there is a, a language and cultural breach um, between the, the countries, and that helps uh, and enables corruption in big time. If I could add to yes. all of that. Yeah. Um, first of all, um, whistleblowers are incredibly important. Um, there's no questions about that. Um, the AML Act of 2020 established a whistleblower program um, for AML CFT and for sanctions violations. Um, FinCEN is currently standing up that program. Um, it's already accepting whistleblower uh, tips and leads. Um, it's gotten a remarkable number of those. Um, there is a funding a, a stream that's been established by Congress as well to support uh, whistleblower tips and leads that result in a prosecution as well to be able to pay out to whistleblowers. And so that is a critical piece of the puzzle. Is that just domestic? Uh, that is with respect to regulated financial institutions in okay. the United States. Okay. Um, so that is a fundamental piece of it um, mm -hmm. to the extent that financial institutions are, do not have effective AML CFT compliance programs or sanctions compliance programs as well. Um, so uh, it cannot be said enough that whistleblowers play a critical role in the overall puzzle. Mm -hmm. um, 
The second piece is with respect to the overall issue with respect to China, um, there is an overarching uh, geopolitical element um, with respect to China, Russia, uh, wherever there are resources to be exploited um, and bad actors who are willing to exploit those resources. I think, though, from a law enforcement and from a AML CFT uh, perspective, um, it's incredibly important to understand where the transshipment points are. Um, for uh, illegal trade in what, illegal min minerals or wildlife, uh, illegal wildlife or whatever it might be, to better understand what those transshipment points, uh, to be able to ensure that uh, governments uh, are able to work together, both on the FIU side as well as on the law enforcement side in terms of bringing together financial institutions, law enforcement partners, um, to be able to be able to exchange information effectively um, to provide feedback um, on that information, and then to be able to cooperatively have law enforcement work together to be able to combat that. Because often what you see with respect to uh, illicit activity that involves transnational organized crime is that there are a range of shell companies, um, mm. opaque entities, that are all working in, in, a, in, a, in a form that's layered. Mm -hmm. um, and it's important to be able to have uh, actors across borders, governmental actors particularly, but also financial institutions, uh, cooperate and exchange information both domestically as well as internationally to be able to better understand these financial flows and to better understand this network of shell companies that are facilitating illicit activity. Um, one of the particular things that FinCEN has uh, focused on is, is Chinese money laundering organizations and their role that they play with respect to uh, facilitating uh, a illicit activity, whether it be drug trafficking or otherwise, because again, they play a critical role in terms of the movement of funds illicitly that are linked to predicate crimes. Uh, the interesting thing that Jahani mentioned is that uh, that uh, the law enforcement tools are generally common across mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, a, a range of different crimes. And it's interesting because when you look at FinCEN, you, the analysts that are involved in uh, tracking shell companies um, uh, uh, and illicit actors linked to the trafficking of fentanyl precursors are the same analysts mm -hmm. who are doing uh, uh, illegal wildlife trafficking and nature crimes more generally because, again, it is fundamentally the – uh, shell companies and the channels through which uh, illicit financial flows are, are moving. Thank you, Hem. Um, maybe just to, to add a little bit on the, the whistleblower um, element. So, so two, two key points on this. One is that um, our experience is that there is often a confusion in the term whistleblower. Uh, and so, or maybe, or maybe two different interpretations. I don't know if it's confusion or not. So there's the broad interpretation, right? Is basically getting information about, uh, get, getting people to speak up about illicit activities related to environmental corruption. Uh, and then there is the narrow definition, which is uh, the protections that are given primarily to civil servants or people working in government uh, to speak up internally or, or specific programs like him was talking about. And so um, I'm mentioning this because um, in the countries that we operate in, there's often this expectation that the uh, protections that are be, uh, ideally given to the latter are also confirmed on the former. And the lack of understanding how dangerous it is dangerous it is to be a whistleblower because there is this assumption that somebody will take care of me um, is really something to, to watch very carefully. And so uh, a number of the countries that we operate in, especially on the corruption prevention systems, we look at things like whistleblower protections that are in place. Um, and and I, I'm actually very concerned about the sort of explosion of discussions about whistleblowers because more often than not as we start engaging on this they will say yes we have a whistleblower protection system and then when we say okay well, what does it involve and they say we have a telephone number people can call uh, and then and then we said okay well what will you do how will you protect people if they come and give you really confidential information how will you ensure that there isn't political interference and there aren't typically those kind of follow-up activities those mm -hmm. guidelines those protocols in place and so, but at the same time, the agency advertises publicly that it encourages whistleblowers. So I think we have to balance sort of our, you know, desire to get information, which is of course quite crucial with a do no harm element right, here. Um, that's really, really tricky. Um, 
Now, in regards to China and BRI, so I think it's it's really fascinating because so we work in Africa and Latin America. Of course, WWF works everywhere. Uh, and what we are seeing, I think, is that the sorts of the increased political uh, pressure that comes along with um, BRI businesses moving in, state-owned enterprises typically moving in, mm-hmm. where where the the political uh, heft uh, of China becomes so significant in a country that law enforcement efforts against Chinese nationals involved in environmental crime as part of these engagements becomes very difficult. So we see that in Africa very much already, uh, and we're starting to see it in Latin America, although not quite as quite as significant yet. Uh, although presumably as there becomes less to extrapolate in Africa, there will be more of it um, in Latin America. Mm-hmm. Now, what I'm really, f- really uh, watching with great fascination is how will the fact that the the steam is running out of BRI, right? Uh, the 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 amounts of money that were there before just aren't there anymore. And so I'm I'm watching with great interest how that will translate into the political power that China can wield in those countries. And so mm. hopefully with some luck it will mean that uh, the the protections that are still in space in place in Latin America are not going to deteriorate to the state that we have in some African countries. Thank you, Yohani. I'm going to turn to the audience. Um, I think we have time. Let's do three questions. So we have one right here, <laughs> and then we'll go to you, sir, in the middle, and then down to the front. And we're going to take them all together. If you p- can please share your name and your affiliation. Sure. Um, Ian Gary, I'm the executive director of the Financial Accountability and Corporate Transparency, or FACT Coalition. I have two questions. Um, one is around um, the point that, that him, you raised about the importance of international cooperation and information sharing related to uh, shell companies. The proposed uh, FinCEN rule for access to the US beneficial ownership database may make it quite difficult for uh, foreign officials in places like Peru or Colombia to access information on beneficial ownership. So could you comment on how, in practice, um, the US might cooperate with countries to share information on the ownership of shell companies as part of environmental investigations. And the second question is, um, there has been a lot of discussion about the issues related to the source countries in terms of uh, these commodities, but less discussion about the types of reforms that should be made in destination countries. One of those that's been flagged by the Financial Action Task Force is um, making uh, foreign environmental crimes predicate offenses for money laundering. Um, the Financial Action Task Force has said the U.S. has a gap in that regard, so I was wondering if panelists could comment on the importance of making environmental crimes predicate offenses. Thank you. Two great questions. Okay, can we take the question here in the, in the center, please? We have a mic right over here. Thank you. Thanks. Good morning. Uh, Bruce Orr, uh, Executive Director, International Wildlife Trust. Uh, this question is mostly from Mr. Das. Um, I spent many years as in the U.S. Justice Department uh, working on international criminal cases, and China was always kind of a black hole. It was very difficult to get cooperation or information on the parts of illegal activity the, in a transnational criminal organization that occurred in China, even more so to get any financial um, exchange of information. Um, but I've also seen in the last few years that the Chinese government has done some big environmental cases, uh, including international ones, which gives me a little bit of hope that the situation might be changing. So I guess my question for you, Mr. Das, is despite the geopolitical situation and all the difficulties that, that come with it, do you see a prospect for increased collaboration with the Chinese government on uh, nature crimes and the financial part of those nature crimes? Thanks. Great question. Okay, um, thank you. My name is Blessed Mklanga, uh, investigative uh, journalist in Zimbabwe. Mm-hmm. Um, so, so I just wanted to, to understand, um, the because there's a big link in Africa between poverty and the abuse of, of uh, natural resources. And this also ties into the laws uh, uh, that are there that uh, prohibit, say, the trade in ivory and, 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 and rhino horns. And these laws, um, the major reason why um, there is a lot of 
uh, environmental crimes because um, where the heads are cowled or where the elephant heads become too big, instead of they being legitimate trade, uh, there's then corruption and smuggling of this because of these laws. Now, what, what do you think in terms of um, these laws that seem to prohibit um, uh, uh, locals from benefiting from their wildlife legitimately and their contribution towards, towards corruption? And the second part of it is, what is the mitigator effect that would bring people out of poverty mm -hmm. so that they begin to appreciate the value of preservation and conservation of their resources so that they can begin to, um, to, to, to value those resources um, as, as a tool for longevity and for environmental preservation than is a tool of getting out of poverty. Thank you. Thank you, Blessed. So the connections between development and conservation and how we make those work together. Um, okay, so we are at time. We're going to have Ambassador Schwarber come back up to the stage in just a minute. So I'm going to ask each of you to take on these, I guess it turned into five questions, <laughs> um, with a brief uh, response and any final remarks that you want to add. Uh, Roberto, I don't want to put you on the spot, but if we could start with you and then we'll make our way down. Well, um, I was going to address oh, the... <laughs> <laughs> oh, blessed, you're missing the answer to your question. But no, that's no, okay. No it's a good problem. question. We can go ahead. <laughs> no, there, there's no conservation. I mean, sustainability talks about the balance between the environment, uh, economy, and, and you know, uh, g growth cannot happen. Sustainable growth is all about the balance. So mm -hmm. uh, hard to talk about conservation when, when you have populations that are uh, in a very bad situation, so we have to strive for for sustainability at, at all at all at all fronts. Not necessarily the laws are, are the best. I know that, and enforcement is not really happening many places. Enforcement is a is a key issue. So th those the questions raised by the gentleman are legitimate, and uh, and the extinction of animals in those same places is legitimate. I mean, is is I'm sorry, is is happening. Uh, so those two realities are, are confronting. And if we don't come to a, a place where uh, we find that balance, it's not going to be possible. Uh, so that, that's on that front. I just wanted to comment on, on the China thing just briefly. Uh, I did tell you about uh, the, uh, the cultural drift that there is. And uh, I have seen with my two own eyes uh, uh, the intermediaries between China and governments. Because some, some of those intermediaries are the ones who speak the language or have connections with China. And I have seen it, um, that there is, a, there is a broken phone, as we call it in Spanish. Uh, uh, the communication comes from one side, gets twisted, and comes to the other side in another way. That's an incredible space for corruption that is happening. And the BRI and, and many other places where China is investing that is that is real a real source of, source of corruption on both sides, by the way. But I just wanted to thank you for for this opportunity. This is an incredible dialogue. I, I thank the Basel Institute and the Wilson Center and USAID. What a wonderful partner they have been on TNRC. So thanks so much for for this invitation. Thank you, Roberto. Johanny. Um, yeah, I won't. I won't go into a UBO. I will leave that simple, sure. simple issue to you. <laughs> <laughs> um, maybe just to say that uh, on on the legitimate, uh, illegitimate trade uh, of of you know um, protected protected species and and their products. Uh, I mean, this is a discussion that we can have spent another hour and a half on. Or day. Uh, yeah, I I think I and and I don't actually I'm not s sufficiently of an expert to say which way is the right way from a conservation perspective our colleagues are here to have the arguments on that I think the only point I would make here is that um, I think the assumption that you know legalizing a certain amount of trade will inherently lead to less corruption is sort of a, a very weak argument uh, mm. I, I can make as many arguments why there would be more corruption by legalizing yeah. the trade so um, that's perhaps not the strongest argument for it but again thank you everybody for the participation and and for you to come for coming. Thank you. Thank you, Yohani. Him. Um, to answer Ian's question uh, on beneficial ownership, um, it's difficult for me to comment because it's an ongoing <coughs> rulemaking process. Um, but I think <coughs> the goal of uh, the regulations is to implement the law. The law is what it says. 
um, and that's the, a key piece of the puzzle. Um, beyond beyond the beneficial ownership access rule, I think that uh, FinCEN is trying to do a lot, um, and the U.S. government is trying to do a lot in terms of establishing uh, FinCEN exchanges and public-private partnerships uh, with countries like South Africa and with other Egmont Group participants to be able to exchange information and find ways to exchange information effectively uh, and efficiently, efficiently taking into account privacy and confidentiality concerns. Mm -hmm. um, again, the information sharing provisions that we have under U.S. law are flexible, but at the same time they're focused on domestic information sharing. And then there's a question around how do you how do you build a information sharing relationship that's effective with a foreign partner within the con constraints of 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 the law. And and we're always looking for a more effective ways to do it. In terms of the question on China, again, you know, I think that there's a lot of room for cooperation, particularly with Hong Kong and the FIU in terms of information sharing mm -hmm. around uh, around um, a broad range of issues um, because of their Agmon group participation. Um, I do think that on the broader geopolitical level, to the extent that there is an opening and an avenue for engagement on climate change or on broader biodiversity issues, the extent to which uh, enforcement um, and uh, and financial crimes are linked to that conversation may provide a broader opening around that area as well. Hmm. Thank you, him. Thank you, each of you, for being here with us today. Um, it's my pleasure to welcome the ambassador back to the stage to wrap us up. Thank you so much, and um, I'm really sorry to be the one to put an end to this discussion. I could have easily spent another hour listening to you. Thanks to all the speakers um, for your contribution and certainly also to, to you, the participants, for, for great questions. I think we've really gotten a, a good overview of what we're dealing with and what needs to be done to, to make progress. For me, a key takeaway um, is certainly how complex this issue is, and that means that we need a real broad range of expertise to, to make progress from biologists to conservationists from law enforcement to, to prosecutors, financial analysts, accountants, auditors, and of course, civil society advocates and, and the private sector. Um, in short, um, if, if I look at this um, agenda develop, it looks to me like the emergence of a really new cross-dimensional discipline. And uh, we need to think about how to embed that strongly in the anti-corruption agenda that we have. The Atlantic Conference is, is obviously the natural format to do that. And um, I think the good examples we have, uh, we need to bring them, we need to bring them there in, in three months. Uh, one of the good examples, uh, Johanna, you mentioned that is, is the Environmental Corruption Practitioners Forum. Um, I think that's a really, um, uh, a really good initiative that brings together hundreds of practitioners and experts around the world um, to, to exchange their experience. Um, we will be happy to continue and support that along, alongside US aid. Um, and I do believe what needs to be strongly um, you know, analyzed there is, is ways you can use the follow the money approach to, to, to get to environmental crime. And the practitioners, of course, um, have engagements that, that are highly, highly customized and they need highly customized tools and targeted, targeted tools to their specific jurisdictions to make to make a difference and there is a lot to learn from from those good practices we've heard a few examples you know latin america has challenges but also has achieved some good results um, one area we hasn't been discussed much is the the area of, of non-conviction based uh, forfeitures mm -hmm. um, indonesia has has well managed to link corruption to environmental cases some things others uh, have struggled with Ukraine, we've heard that, is piloting really prosecutions related to ecocide and uses financial analysis tool to calculate losses and damages from, from the Russian aggression. And the US is, is going ahead and builds strong bilateral partnerships, formats to exchange information to address wildlife trafficking, such as with South Africa, but also has key experience to share um, with information sharing formats with the private sector that I think we can all we can all learn from. So accordingly, work on follow the money approach will have to deepen its broad educational efforts on financial investigation tools and develop more peer sharing networks for financial investigations and analysts um, to receive coaching and, and training in, in their efforts. 
we will continue to support the Basel Institute. I'm sure we will be back at the Wilson Center for more discussion on this. Um, I think a specific um, track we will take is also supporting the Basel Institute develop some written input into the Atlanta conference uh, that can be can be shared with everybody. The challenge ahead is to ensure that the tools the pr practitioners have developed are rolled out as widely as possible uh, throughout government and, and civil society. Fighting climate change and the degradation of our planet is going to be hard enough. We simply cannot allow poor governance and corruption to undermine the little hard-fought progress that we've made. Uh, we will be keeping pushing this agenda and we're really glad to do that with, with all of you uh, in the coming months and years. Thank you very much for, for being here today. Um, for those who are in the room, um, you're very warmly invited to continue discussing uh, with the panelists uh, over coffee and pastries, courtesy of the Wilson Center. For everybody else who's joined online, thank you very much for your time and um, let's continue the discussion. Thanks so much. Exactly.